Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. I'd like to welcome you to this special edition of the Misquoting Jesus podcast. This week, I'm not being interviewed by Megan. I'm interviewing uh, a fellow scholar and a friend of mine, Jeffrey Syker, uh, who is an expert on a large number of things, including the question uh, questions dealing with homosexuality in the Bible. Uh, I'm first going to introduce Jeff. And then we'll chat for a bit, and then we're going to get right on to uh, what what he thinks about this uh, rather intriguing and important topic. So, uh, Jeff Syker, I, I've known Jeff Syker for God, I don't know, forty years. Forty years. <laughs> forty <No>. years. <laughs> we were Jeff was uh, two years behind me uh, at um, Princeton Theological Seminary in our PhD programs. Jeff had come to Princeton um, in I guess in nineteen eighty three. Uh, from uh, he did a he did a master's degree at Yale uh, before coming to Princeton Seminary, and w- when he uh, when he graduated from Princeton Seminary, he uh, went on uh, for a, a long term uh, teaching career uh, at Loyola Marymount uh, University in um, in California in Los Angeles. Uh, this was an interesting uh, teaching career for him because uh, Jeff is actually a Presbyterian and Loyola Marymount is Jesuit. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, it is. And so he, he's a wide ranging guy. So <laughs> Jeff was the uh, Jeff was a professor of theological studies uh, there in the Department of Theological Studies um, and was the uh, he he was the chair of that department for a uh, for a long time. He also was the chair of uh, classics and archaeology. At not Loyola at the same Marymount. time. Not at the same time, uh, luckily. Uh, so, and Jeff has done a lot of things in a lot of different areas, including uh, a lot of things. One of his main interests is actually in Jewish and Christian relationships in uh, in the ancient world. For a uh, for a spell, he was a fellow at the Hartman Institute uh, for Jewish Christian uh, relations in in Jerusalem uh, for a, for a couple summers. Jeff is a uh, is an accomplished uh, author. And scholar, uh, principally uh, of the New Testament, but of he's an expert in the Bible generally and in early Christianity. Is um, he's he has written uh, or edited eight books over the years. Uh, his most uh, the most recent one is on sin. <laughs> sin. Don't leave home without it. Yeah, don't leave home without it. And uh, we we he and I could both tell stories about sin, but I don't think we want to go there. <laughs> no. Uh, his book is called Sin, New Testament Perspectives with Oxford uh, University Press. Um, Je- among his eight books, two of the ones that he he has edited, in fact, involve this issue of homosexuality in the Bible. Uh, one is called uh, Homosexuality in the Church, Both Sides of the Debate, a uh, collection of essays, by uh, scholars who who are saying sort of what you know different views of, of, about homosexuality within the Christian Church, and then then the other is he's an editor of an encyclopedia <laughs> called Homosexuality and Religion, um, and so he is he is quite an expert uh, on that and many other things. When when we were in graduate school together, Jeff uh, published one of his early uh, articles that was called "The Canonical Status of the Catholic Epistles in the Syriac New Testament." So, uh, Jeff, sometime we need to get together and talk about the Syriac New Testament. The New Syriac Testament. New Testament, yes. It's a, it's a hot topic for podcasts these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, so well, anyway, so, Jeff, uh, welcome. Welcome to the Thank Misquoting you. Jesus uh, podcast. Thanks for coming on. So, uh, what, yeah, what I did so mention it, is that you, you've you moved from Los Angeles uh, to uh, North Carolina. <laughs> so, Well, uh, it, it comes with... Uh, a little early retirement because apparently you can sell your home in Los Angeles and buy half the state of North Carolina, so, <laughs> That's right. where my wife is. Uh, my wife Judy is from. Yes. And by the way, folks, uh, Bart introduced me to my wife, uh, although he had no intentions of us getting married and living happily ever after. I, I don't think he's disappointed by that, but uh, it's been actually great uh, a great joy to be back in North Carolina, close to you and Sarah, and um, and here we are. Here we are. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, Jeff married actually one of my former Ph.D. students. 
<laughs> I introduced them at a professional meeting, and uh, yeah, they fell madly in love. And so when they when they got married, uh, Jeff asked me if I would be willing to be the best man, and uh, I told him that I I was just happy being the better man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Why isn't she marrying the best man? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, she, you know, she had to settle. So, uh, uh, right, okay. So, Jeff, we're we're going to talk about um, homosexuality uh, and the Bible, and um, uh, as I know, and as people are going to know, um, your basic view. If I tell me if I'm misstating this, because I, I don't mean to be misstating it, but your your basic view is that the Bible does not condemn what we think of as homosexuality. Is that is that fair to say? Basi- basically, yeah, basically. Okay, well, give me the give me the one or two sentence uh, correct view beyond <laughs> beyond basic. Um, well, I I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one is that the language um, of homosexuality, the term itself when applied to the Bible, is somewhat anachronistic um, because, uh, and even in the you know, the 20th century, there have been different understandings of what homosexuality means. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, homosexuality was largely seen as a perverse choice against nature, which, you know, has been the long tradition uh, over the centuries. But then by the mid 50s, you start having language of homosexuality as a preference, which is uh, it's still a choice, but it's a preference um, and but much more neutral language. And then finally, um, towards the end of the 20th century and now especially, the language is all about orientation um, so that it's not a choice you make, uh, you know, it's like eye color or handedness. It's something you discover about yourself. And so, um, it's natural. And so, whereas at the beginning of the 20th century, homosexuality was seen as unnatural and uh, you could quote, we'll get to the Romans one passage that it's, um, against nature, you know, by the end of the 20th century, um, people are using actually the argument from nature that, well, no, this is part of the variety of sexual orientations. Um, you know, so. So you're uh, saying that that they used to say, they used to use the argument for nature to show that homosexuality was sinful or wrong. And now they use the argument from nature to say that, in fact, it's a natural it's a natural phenomenon. Yeah, so, it's rather it's rather ironic. It is um, ironic. That, that yeah. gets that gets turned on its head. The other thing I would say is that um, the fight uh, within the churches about homosexuality uh, is rather different, depending upon whether you're in the Roman Catholic tradition or in the Protestant tradition. In the Roman Catholic tradition, it's all about um, procreation. Um, that's the issue. It's not about whether. Uh, uh, somebody can be ordained who is openly gay because in the Catholic church, of course, all priests are supposedly celibate. And so it doesn't matter technically if you're gay or not um, because you're celibate. The issue is procreation and the Protestant tradition. It has nothing to do with procreation. It's all about ordination and modeling uh, what a Christian life uh, should be like. And so can an openly gay person model the Christian faith um, and all of these arguments go back to the, you know, six texts uh, that we're going to discuss in the Bible, three in the Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible, three in the New Testament. Um, so, um, yeah, so my position is that um, you have to take into account the cultural contexts in which same-sex relations were uh, broached in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. And those contexts are are rather different than our contexts today. The other uh, fight that goes on is whether uh, nature uh, is the same at all times and in all places, uh, or whether our understanding of nature and what's natural develops and changes over time. And so you end up with rather different understandings of the applicability 
uh, okay. these passages. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I, you know, I think uh, there are a lot of people who are going to be very interested in sort of Christian attitudes and what happens in denominations these days. And a lot of people are just interested in what the Bible says. And I think a lot of people are going to say that, look, um, the Bible's, I mean, it's pretty clear. <laughs> and so let me, yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, the passages better than I do, but, but uh, <laughs> the, to, I mean, especially the people point to these two verses in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus, right. So Leviticus 18.22, so let me just read it to you so you can't Go for you know, it. W- wiggle out of this. <laughs> yep. I'll, As it I'll, says, I'll wiggle. You, it says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Okay. And then two chapters later, so it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man. And then uh, the uh, two chapters later in chapter 20, verse 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Pretty serious. That sure sounds like the Bible's condemning homosexuality. Well, again, um, you have to ask, what are they talking about? Um, And the context is crucial. So the context of both of these passages in Leviticus is what's called the Holiness Code. And this is um, instructions given to the people as they're getting ready to go into the land, uh, the promised land that God has given them. And basically, God is saying, don't do the things that the people who uh, I'm kicking out of the land, don't do the things that they did um, because it was idolatrous and um, against my law. And the difficulty is that um, there's no rationale given for the prohibition. Um, They're just prohibitions, one with a rather severe punishment, but there are all kinds of other prohibitions, you know, against wearing garments made of two different materials, uh, uh, sowing two different kinds of seed in the same field, uh, uh, getting a tattoo, uh, shaving your beard into a point. And so it looks like the condemnation is of various practices of uh, the people who preceded them in the land. Um, and and so there's a, a generic just kind of condemnation of don't do those kinds of things, okay. um, so especially me, I, mixing different things, mixing different things, mixing yeah, so two I different mean, things together. So let me just ask it is which, which is forbidden shaving your beard into a point or not shaving it into a point? <laughs> Yeah, that would uh, that wouldn't matter to you, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got any facial hair, you got to know these things. So, uh, uh, right, okay. So, um, so the idea then is what you're saying. Then, I mean, you're admitting that this says that men should not sleep with men. Yes. But you're saying you're also not supposed to wear a sweater that's also made of cotton and polyester or something because well, and that's and that's the difficulty. How do you how do you pick and choose? Um, and you know, Jesus says in Matthew, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law. And whoever relaxes the least of these commandments will be least in the kingdom. Well, you know, the rabbis had rather serious disagreements. In fact, one of the most interesting disagreements the rabbis had, um, and this is um, in the Talmudic uh, times, uh, a little later. So the question was, could a woman who has had sexual relations with a woman marry a rabbi. And one school of thought said, absolutely not, because she's defiled her body. Another school of thought said, well, what can she do? She doesn't have semen. Huh. So, sure. Okay. Um, and, and so understandings of same-sex relations, um, you know, it, it changes. And, you know, as you know, in the Greco-Roman era, in both Greek culture and Roman culture, there are developing ideas about uh, same-sex relations. Okay, um, and so, that also interplays with um, what the early Christians thought and the Jews. Mostly, they, you know, they were familiar with some practices in the Greco-Roman world, and these are practices of uh, idolaters. These are. Uh, the practices of, you know, these people um, whom God would condemn. Um, and, okay, and the but, same, but before, Jeff, before we get to the Greco-Roman world, I want to 
I want to ask you um, a little bit more about the Old Testament because I'm still want to make sure I understand the point about the, these Old Testament passages. So it sounds like you're agreeing that, you know, look, the law of Moses says a man's not supposed to sleep with a man. <laughs> but it also says, you know, this thing about not sowing your field, you know, you're not supposed to put both barley and wheat in the same field or, yes. and, and there are, there are these other things about, you know, pointed beards and things that nobody really thinks apply today. Exactly. <laughs> and so, and so the problem is that people, you know, ignore four fifths of the law as, or more as not being relevant. Uh, but they pick the one thing that they personally have an opinion about that, you know, so they use the Bible to support their view, even though they're actually not saying the Bible is authoritative. They're just picking the one they want. Is that, well, and it's, that a, and it's, it's a non-contextual reading of the Bible, both historically, culturally, and also just, I mean, if you, if you look at the passages, all you have to do is look at the passage just before and the passage just after, and you end up, as you say, cherry picking. Yeah, this doesn't apply. This does apply. And the question is, what kind of rationale is there? You know, I have I have a lot of students. And you probably you probably did too. Who uh, Christian students who will tell you tell you that um you know what do you you know what do you think of the law of Moses? And they say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments, but that's you know just I just think the Ten Commandments apply. But then you ask them, okay, have you ever had a like a job on a Saturday? <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to, well, but you know that's against the Ten Commandments. You, you can't work on the Sabbath. Yeah. So you know they keep the Nine Commandments. <laughs> so even <laughs> even with the Ten Commandments, like they're they're picking. And and the thing is, people who want to quote these verses from Leviticus to condemn same sex relations. Why aren't they condemning people who are wearing sweaters and no, people who are? I exactly. mean, it's because. You know, it's because they just want to they want to they want an authority and they find one rather than actually trusting the authority for what it says altogether. So, OK, OK, fair well, enough. The, the other thing that I think is important to say is that um, when you have passages and you're not exactly sure how to interpret them, um, it's it's typical to appeal to other sources of authority. Mm -hmm. So tradition is one source of authority. Um, what have um, you know, the elders taught? What has the church taught? Or um, not only tradition, but experience uh, becomes an authority. Um, I love this passage actually in Galatians, where Paul appeals to the experience of the Galatians. What was your experience in, in terms of the spirit? How did you get the spirit? And then finally, reason, uh, rational discourse becomes an authority. Uh, and when you put all these things together um, and you sift through, uh, you know, what the Bible has to say about um, same sex relations, if you, if you privilege tradition and scripture uh, read out of context, then it's going to be a very conservative interpretation. If you privilege uh, experience and uh, reason, then you're going to come out uh, in a much more liberal side. Um, so, yeah. but I would I mean, say that, you know, most, I mean, most, you know, in our context here where you and I live in the South, the idea that you're supposed to use experience and reason to interpret the Bible just means you're not listening to to God, <laughs> you, you think you know it all, and so you know. So for people who believe in the Bible, I mean, it, you know, it sounds like like you and I prefer like thinking about things, but some people just want to quote Bible verses. But you're saying that even those who do that aren't really doing that. Maybe they're just they're they are using their reason. <laughs> they're choosing. They are. They're choosing yep. which things. And so, but what about you know? There's also arguments that that people have made. Uh, that I, I assume you have too, that when the Bible, I don't know, when the Bible says, you know, a male shall not lie with a male, that's not talking about what we consider to be homosexuality. Yes. That's, that's, okay, yes, I would, I would right? say that as well. So yeah. what, so what, could you explain what that means? Yeah. Um, partly it depends on um, ancient constructs of sexual relations. So for example, um, you know, people used to quote the Genesis 19 passage, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, because these two strangers visiting the city, happen, happening to be angels, as it turns out, uh, the townspeople want to know them. And there's a sexual overtone to that because Lot offers his daughters in place of the men. Um, 
And the translation. So, so these, guys, these guys are staying in Lot's house, and yeah. and the uh, the town gathers around, bangs on the door, and they want to know know the men in the biblical sense. In said. the biblical sense, that's exactly right. And the translations and, are all over the place. Um, but but the lot gives him his, agree. Not, his daughters. <laughs> what? Well, no, <laughs> almost all of them agree that um, uh, this is the townspeople wanting to show dominance over these visitors, wanting to show power over these visitors. And so what mattered in antiquity was whether you were in the dominant or the submissive position. And so you want to be the male who penetrates rather than acting uh, as a female who is penetrated. Um, and this this also carried over into Greco-Roman culture, um, where we, we do have evidence of same-sex relations, but what seems to most matter is whether you're in the dominant position or a passive position. But so why, um, I mean, why does God fire, bring down fire and brimstone on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah if they, if it's not sexual, if it's not, they want to rape the, these two men, right? Well, yeah, rape. I mean, it's it's simply a further indication of how depraved Sodom and Gomorrah are. So, I mean, God has already pronounced judgment, um, but Abraham has bargained God down, as you know, to ten. If there are ten righteous people, don't destroy the town. But you know, they can't find. They can't even find that. Um, and they're uh, wanting to to rape these visitors. Um, is You're saying the different. Another. The problem isn't that they want to have sex with men. The problem is they want to. I mean, the, these are guests in Lot's house, right? Yeah. I mean, there, so it's in hospitality, and it's the fact that they. It, it's it's a condemnation of sexual violence. Yeah. Yeah, they're condemning. So it's condemning violence against these guests, and and his his kind of sacred obligation is to protect his guests. Yes. That he takes so seriously that he says, uh, "Yeah, okay, yeah. Here, I'll give you my two daughters." That's the lesser <laughs> sin. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, so yeah, apart from the kind of morality of all that, yeah. <laughs> uh, giving away your daughters, but it, it turns out not happening, of course, because right. they escape and um, and God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. But the sin, but it's actually in the Bible the, the idea that they are condemned for uh, wanting to rape men. That it's male with male. That's not. That's never talked about in the Bible as being the problem. For, with Sodom and Gomorrah. No, that's true. It's yeah. it's um, injustice and hospitality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so it sounds like you're saying that even even if the Old Testament is saying, you know, a male aligned with a male, it's not actually what we think of as homosexuality. Can you just no. say something about sexuality, like as a concept in the like? Like how our how our understanding of sexuality might differ from somebody living three thousand years ago. Yeah, um, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, and, I mean, different cultures at different times develop different understandings of uh, male female sexual relations, male male sexual relations. Um, and, and and so it's it's a moving target. I mean, there are certainly constants uh, th that you can find, um, but it's a moving it's a moving target. And even so, in our own day today, I mean, if you look at Latino culture with notions of machismo, or if you look at uh, African American culture, um, which is much less open typically to uh, same sex relations. Um, it it's it's you're not always talking about the same thing and in antiquity also you're not talking about uh, an understanding of uh sexuality in the same sense that, that we talk about sexuality um and sexual identity uh okay. so i mean it's earlier you said that you know even in the 20th century they moved from kind of uh homosexuality is against nature to homosexuality is natural. But it, I mean, it does seem that in the modern world, we've been so influenced by post-Freudian post psychology, and mm -hmm. we think in terms of sexual orientation yes. now. That's kind of the common way of thinking about it, is that we think that humans are you know, some people, some people still deny you're kind of born this way, but, but you, you have a sexual orientation, which means that you are inclined to have sex with, 
person of your, the same sex or of, of the opposite sex or other or both. Obviously. You know, and now they're, you know, we now know, I mean, we no longer talk strictly about binaries anymore, but, right. but, but, but it's the idea that you've got an orientation. I mean, I assume that people in Leviticus did not think about sexual orientation that you like. You no, know. they, they, they certainly did not. They certainly and, did not. So they're condemning an act. Yes. But they're not condemning an orientation because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, historically, we, you and I have both known people and everybody's probably known people who feel very guilty uh, because they're, uh, they're attracted to people of the same yeah. sex. And that's, yeah. they consider that to be a sin, but it, it can hardly be a sin from the Bible because the people in the Bible didn't even know about orientation. <laughs> no, the, the, what the people in the Bible cared about was uh, physical acts, um, not about um and your feelings. I mean, one of the things that's interesting in uh, for people who want to make a case for same-sex relations, you know, they point to you know David and Jonathan. Hmm. Um, that you know David loved Jonathan. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's not that's not what we would call homosexuality. That's what we would call brotherly love i i think well even if um, it was i mean it's you know even if he was attracted to him it's not that he would define that as orientation no words, he, no i mean of course people in the ancient world wanted i mean the number the percentage of people who were uh were homosexual in the ancient world is the same percentage as today the brain is not <laughs> you know we it's not that our brains have changed and so probably it's just the same number of sleeping with other people it's just it, that it, they didn't have this idea well, yeah, it may well be. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, today um, people uh, are not in the closet in the same way that they were. And so many more yeah. people feel free to to discuss uh, their sexual identity. But there are still cultures where um, it's, it's kind of taboo. Um, I mean, there's... Uh, one of the things I learned when I was editing the book, uh, the encyclopedia, in Native American traditions, uh, there were individuals uh, who were identified as two-natured or two-spirited, hmm. who were seen as holy figures who could communicate with uh, the divine. And, you know, they, they were considered to have both male and female spirits. Um, and so... Kind of a transgender uh, relationship, all in themselves, um, and it, so it's just to say that you know, if you're in Japan, there's one understanding. If you're in China, there's another understanding. If you're if you're in the United States, um, yeah, you know, there's still another understanding. Now, in fact, there are lots of understandings. <laughs> yes, there there certainly are. And so, but so, it gets back to the question of, all right, so what's normative, what's not, and why? Yeah. So, but I guess you would say then that, I mean, um, I, I mean one, one problem today is that people will agree, yes, you have that orientation and that, that can't be sinful because you can't help it. But if you have that orientation, you better not act on it. And that yes. way they think they're following the Bible. And, uh, but that, that creates as much damage as anything. Yeah. What I, I, in the Presbyterian church, the language used to be, uh, are you a practicing homosexual? <laughs> right. Practicing. Yeah. Practicing. Yeah. Practicing. Yeah. yeah. Pr practice every Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let, okay. So that's the old Testament. It sounds like your basic line is look, when you're, when you're reading the Old Testament, you've got to put it into its own historical context and understand what these people mean at that time. And you can't just transplant it to some other situation. You don't do that with most of the Old Testament. Why do you do it with this one issue? <laughs> and so, no, and and not only that. I mean, you have to hunt for these passages. Yeah, you yeah. really have to hunt for them. Um, well, the two there's there's two. I mean, in Leviticus. So that's kind of it in in terms yeah. of commands. That's it. That is. The Old Testament's a big book. <laughs> it's it's a very big book. Yeah. And um, people condemn and, homosexuality. They they don't mind doing all the other things that the prophets condemn. Oh my <laughs> word. Yeah. No, if you want to look at a condemnation of of you know the rich against the poor and yeah. oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so no. okay, but so let's let's move to uh so I think for a lot of a lot of people, mo most people probably are kind of interested in the Leviticus stuff, but or the Sodom and Gomorrah, but you know, once you get to Jesus, you know that starts really kind of uh, where the rubber meets the road for a lot of people. And Jesus, so to speak, yeah, the, yeah, so to say, 
<laughs> right. Okay, we ain't going Edit there. Edit that out. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so when G, I mean, Jesus, Jesus does not come out and say, you know, uh, thou shalt not commit homose- homosexual acts. He doesn't say right. that. But there is that famous passage where Jesus is asked about um, whether divorce is legitimate. Yes. And Jesus uh, points out that in the beginning, um, God created uh, male and female. And uh, and so, you know, man shall leave his mother and woman leave her home and the two shall cling together, together and be one flesh. And that seems to presuppose that the standard that Jesus has in mind is one man, one woman for life. I think that's right. OK, so Jesus is against homosexuality. No, Jesus is a first century Jew. Um, I mean, the question to ask Jesus is, what about Abraham and his and his many wives? Uh, or what about concubines? Uh, what about, you know, those who were celibate? Um, you know, those who were celibate were not exactly uh, looked up to as examples of what you should do. You should get married and have kids. Yeah, and even um, Jesus was probably celibate. I mean, Jesus yeah, and even married Jesus with kids. was probably celibate. Whatever Dan Brown tells us, he was not married with kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think Jesus uh, had a view of if he ever thought about same-sex relations. Uh, who the hell knows? But if he did, he probably had a typically Jewish understanding that, oh, that's something that pagans do. That's something, you know, that he's heard about, but has no, you know, firsthand knowledge of, I would I would say. Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, it is it is, you know, there are uh, people may not know that there are there are scholars who have had who have argued that, in fact, Jesus and Paul uh, we're both gay in our terms. Uh, and, uh, we, you and I have a friend, Jeff, uh, Jeff, um, Dale Martin, who wrote a yes. book called sex and the single savior. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and, a, and a good book it is. Well, he, and he was, you know, he was a senior professor of new Testament at Yale. So he's yes. not, he's not some guy, somebody just guy is spouting off stuff on the internet. He's actually, no, he's not. And so, um, so there are, you know, there are discussions about that kind of thing, but the, I think again, the point surely must be that whatever Jesus said, he, he doesn't have our concept of sex and sexuality or homosexuality. And so to say that he condemns something, he's never even, he doesn't even have any language for this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, that that's that's true. But you know, but but the I mean, Bible readers do point out that homosexuality is condemned. I mean, Paul, Paul the Apostle Paul, in uh, as you know, in First Corinthians six, makes a list of activities or people Vices. people yes. who will not who will not get into the kingdom of heaven, and it includes I don't know what it includes murderers and adulterers and whatever, and and homosexuals. Well, so, but again, that, the uh, well, now we're getting into uh, translation issues, uh, as you well know. Um, it's it's a vice list, and it's kind of a generic vice list. Um, and vice lists were rather uh, common in antiquity. And Paul is saying, don't do these kinds of things. And so there are sexual sins. Uh, and one of the sexual sins is um, the Greek words are... Uh, the malakoi, uh, which literally means soft ones, and masculine. The, it's a masculine yeah. malakoi. It's masculine, yeah. masculine soft people, apparently. Yeah, soft but, people. Yeah, and then the arsenokoitai, um, the the arson, the the male who koitai goes to bed. Okay, so um, let's let's think about this word for a second. So malakoi is non problematic for those of you who are not uh, Greek scholars. Uh, malakoi just means soft, like you can talk, have a soft pillow, malakos pillow, or something. But arsenokoites, um, the plural is is arsenokoitai, as you say, right? Um, so uh, this does this word appear before Paul? Does he make it this does one up? in the Septuagint, sort of, sort of, sort of, and in, Le- in the Leviticus passages, um, uh, a man who goes to bed with another man. Uh, and so the that language is used, um, mm. but uh, but the word itself isn't there, right? In no, other words, it's no. So arson, so it's it's made up of two words, right? Uh, so arsenokoites. So I guess people we get would coitus know, from coitus, yeah. And arson is the the 
it's a form of the verb for a male, an adult yes. male. Yes. And so the word means something like adult male bed. <laughs> yes. Now, what's what's interesting is when you put it together with Malakoy, uh-huh. because Malakoy is clearly a euphemistic term. Yes. Um, because if you just translate it as soft people, it makes absolutely no sense. Means people but, don't work uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll, they'll never get into the kingdom. <laughs> Go to the gym, right. guys. Flabby people, you're right out. Um, but it goes with arsenokoites. Uh, and I think the best uh, translation would be uh, male prostitutes and those who hire their services. Whoa. Wow, that's interesting. So, Isn't that you know, interesting? So you know, the uh, I we we did an episode earlier where I did a um, I did an episode for the podcast with uh, Jenny Knuse, whom you know. Yes, and we were talking. About, she was on the NRSV updated right. edition thing, and we were, we ended up talking about arsenokoitai because she. Oh, okay. She was. Yeah, it's really complicated because it literally means something like man beds. Yes, <laughs> and so like, but people. So normally it's translated. So these two words, just so people will know what we're talking about. In First Corinthians six. Jeff, do you know what verse is? Six, six nine. nine. Thank you. So the verse says, you know, all these people, including Malakoy and Arson Koitai, will not enter into the kingdom. And so since you've got the soft and you've got the man bed, it the the what I think when we were in graduate school, what a lot of people were saying is that that, that refers to the man who is on the receiving end of the sex act, the, the, soft. the soft man who's behaving like a woman, and the Arson Koitai is the man who's having sex with him. So the man who's penetrating is uh is also condemned uh and that so it's the passive partner and the active partner male yes. partners in the sex act um yeah. and that was always thought of as interesting when we were in graduate school because it's it is the case you've brought up several times about the greek and roman worlds but it it was the case especially in greek society that um the man who's doing the penetrating is normally not condemned because exactly. Uh, he's being a man. The man, men are supposed to dominate. You you brought up domination earlier. Men are supposed to dominate. So if you're dominating another man, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Well, and, and to, to put it crassly, as, as one of my classics colleagues once put it, um, what matters is that you're the sticker and not the sticky. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. You got to be on top is basically the thing. Yeah. Right. Basically. So, although, I mean, it, it, um, it didn't always involve penetration. Uh-huh. Um, just as often, if not more so, it, it's what would be called intra intracural. It's a hard yeah. to pronounce word. Yeah, where um, the penis goes between the legs. It's and the thighs. It's yeah, not, yeah, right. it's not anal intercourse. Right. So, but it's the uh, man who is being on the receptive end of it yes. that is being a in this in this interpretation. That person is being soft because it, it's it's built into this whole ideology, right? That that. Um, it, like men and women, it's not that they're just like two different kinds of things. It's really more no. like, like two different degrees of things. Right? One's more po- one's more powerful than the other. And you don't want to if you're a man, you don't want to play the woman, as it were. And so um, peder- pederasty, which is one of the contexts uh, that we know about in antiquity, uh, typically would involve an, an older male who would uh, provide tutelage for uh, an older boy, uh, and once they hit puberty, once they start growing hair, it then becomes inappropriate uh, to continue that relationship. Um, And it's not just a sexual relationship, if it even is a sexual relationship. Um, I mean, so there are all these, you know, vase paintings and... (laughs) Yes, there are. But the idea is that the older man is, since he's an adult, he can dominate the, the Exactly. Pure, and and so that's okay. You can show him the way. If you're enjoying the Misquoting Jesus podcast, you'd probably like my online courses as well. I've produced a number so far with multi-lecture courses on the New Testament Gospels and the books of the Pentateuch, standalone lectures on the Christmas story and the earliest Christian views of Jesus and a six-hour debate on whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead. If you're interested, check them out at bartherman.com. You'll receive a discount on your purchase simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. And it, and so does he, and the, um, 
And the uh, in Greek in Greek cultures, like in classical Athens, this was just yep. kind of an accepted practice. And so they exactly. they absolutely did not consider that to be unnatural. They considered that to be natural. But, no, yeah. yeah, yeah. Whether you're whether you're with uh, a woman um, or uh, with a the boy a man, you know, or a you, slave, or a slave, yeah, you slave could prostitution, a slave. Yeah. and and but the, that meant that you. So, I mean, part of the idea is that men are superior, like strong men are superior to yes. weak men, soft men, to women, to children. And yep. it's kind of a continuum where you really want to be this kind of strong- Macho man. Macho man, yeah. So we, if that's the case, then if if it is that Malakoy are soft ones and Arsenokoitai are the strong ones, but they're both being condemned, okay, that would be a condemnation. But you're saying you don't think that's it at all. You think, in fact, it's somebody who is- um, buying a male prostitute and somebody who's a male prostitute is that well i i think that's um i think that's certainly one way to interpret it um because unfortunately the um some of the translations say not homosexual some of them say sodomites which then incorporates the whole genesis 19 passage yeah. wrongly yeah. um um and the question is whether you translate these two words as one term, homosexuals, which some do, or whether you try and translate them as no, they're they're two words. They they may have a relationship to each other. They probably do. And then how do you do that? And you know, typically you want to go with what's going to be the most generic and least specific translation. I think I forget how they do it in the um, updated revised. Um, I forget too, but it, they they paraphrase it with something about engage in sexual immorality or something. I uh, don't know, but okay. yeah. But so the trick is, I guess we didn't quite say this, but this term arsenicoite, the taste that we we I asked whether it was invented by Paul. The, the reason we aren't sure what it means is because it doesn't get used. <laughs> no, we've never. It, it, that's the only place it occurs. Yeah. So yeah. and and people who later used you know the Paul's passage because yes. most most Greek words occur like you know twenty nine trillion times in Greek <laughs> literature, and so you can pretty much figure out what they mean because they show. There up is a it. literature I hear. There is a literature there, and this word doesn't show up, and so like it's, no. it's a made-up word, and you're not quite sure it has, involves a man and involves a bed, <laughs> but it's not quite sure. And just but, to use another, just to use another uh, a, a good term, it's a hopox legomena. A hopox legomena, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's a good word, good term. But so a hopox legomena, by the way, is a term that occurs once. <laughs> it is said once. So, um, okay, but um, I think some people have pointed out that when these terms. When the term does get used later, it tends to be in a context of economic sins. That's one of Dale Martin's arguments, I think, is that it yeah. occurs. But that that would that supports the idea that it's prostitution, that mm -hmm. it's sex for sale, mm -hmm. uh, that is being condemned buying buying male sex. Some yes. people have argued like temple prostitution. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. But the reality is, it's really hard to use a word. That we don't know the meaning of in order to condemn a modern practice <laughs> especially when it's it just appears kind of you know in passing yeah. literally in passing yeah. in a vice list yeah and the first list. timothy passage the same thing it's in yeah. passing in a vice list yeah. and you know vice lists are just clubs that you use and the longer the list the bigger the club you're swinging um yeah but it, it's not like i mean the fact that there are sexual uh sins, as it were, uh, being identified, tells you that, okay, there's some issues in Corinth with people um, acting in sexually immoral ways. Yeah. Well, that yeah, right. And, you know, if everybody was condemned for everything that's con that the Corinthians are condemned for, <laughs> nobody would get into the kingdom of heaven. That was so, a happening church, man. It was, boy, yeah, he, 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 Paul begins his letter of 1 Corinthians by addressing it to the saints who are in Corinth. <laughs> <laughs> He's being what, ironic. You wonder what those sinners look like. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So one last passage we, we need to talk about quickly is that um, one you mentioned earlier, Romans chapter one. The most significant this, to the passages. Yeah. So why don't you t tell us what's in Romans one and what Paul's just tell us about this passage. Romans one. Um, here we'll, we'll, we'll break out the text. How about that? For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and something else of man who are <laughs> Romans 118. 
Uh, yeah, since it's, it's, yeah. I don't want to miss. I don't want to misquote Paul, let alone Jesus. Jesus. Yes, not on this podcast. <laughs> this podcast has not misquoted Jesus with Bart Ehrman so that you can misquote <laughs> Jesus with Bart Ehrman. <laughs> so um, here we go. So this is uh, Romans 1, uh, 24 following. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the degrading of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to wait for it. Turn the page. God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural and in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own person the due penalty for their error yeah well that was used for some horrible horrific purposes in the 1980s Yes, it was. Um, yeah, yeah. People deserve to get AIDS. Yeah, uh, was God, because the they received. Some... Their, yeah. So this passage, uh, who's Paul generally talking about here? Is he? What's the issue that these people are being turned over to degrading well, sexual activities? Well, I mean, what Paul is saying, and there's a debate about this. Of course, you know, is Paul talking about uh, creation and that God created male and female and now it's being violated? And the answer is no. Paul's talking about idolatry. Idolatry. Uh, and that idolatry leads to worshiping creation rather than worshiping the creator, worshiping God. Okay. And the consequence of this is people get screwed up. They so to get, say, yeah. So, but, but the, in other words, he's talking about all the pagans, right? He's talking yeah. about like 95% of the world. Uh, the re so the reason they engage in this kind of crazy sexual activity in his view is because God's given them up. Yeah. I mean, Paul, what Paul's trying to do is to say, all right, there's an, it all comes back to sin, of course. Um, there's Gentile sin, which is fundamentally idolatry. And there's Jewish sin, which he'll get to, uh, which is disobedience. Mm. And everybody has sinned. Everybody's guilty so that God may eventually have mercy upon all. But here he's just trying to say that um, one of the consequences of idolatry is people acting in what Paul considers unnatural ways, excessively lustful. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it begs the question of what's natural and what's mm -hmm. unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, and what's excessively lustful and, and what's not. I mean, one of the things that, um, one of the things that uh, I know uh, LGBT people got tired of many moons ago was people thinking all they do is think about sex. <laughs> and that's all yeah. they do. It's just, yeah. it's all about sex. And of course, yeah. No, you know, yeah. we go to the grocery store and we have jobs and um, yeah. Yeah. we're regular people. Uh, so, um, yeah, but so, so this passage has been used as uh, a bat to swat at, at people who are um, who claim to be Christians and yet also claim to be gay. Because Paul says that it's an un it's unnatural to engage in these activities and that it's because God's abandoned you that you do these things. Yes, exactly. So, well, okay. So it does say that. <laughs> so how does the Bible not condemn homosexuality? Well, again, you have to ask, what is Paul talking about? Okay. And what he's talking about, so what does Paul know about same-sex relations? Well, he likely knows about pederasty. He likely knows about prostitution. Does he know of uh, same-sex relations between uh, equal adult males? I would say unlikely. And even if he did, he would probably condemn them. Yeah. But Paul knew what he knew in his context. Yeah. And so um, our context is, is rather different. Uh, now, does this mean we don't take Paul seriously? No, I think the way you take Paul seriously is taking him 
with his understanding as a first century Jew, a first century Christian of uh, relationships, sexual relationships and what what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, yeah, well, you he, know, you he, would, he, you certainly wouldn't take Paul if Paul started talking about, um, you know, cosmology and started talking about what the solar system is. You wouldn't you know, you wouldn't take that as authoritative. <laughs> right. He doesn't know. Well, I wouldn't, I mean, but well, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, if he thinks that the uh, you know that the earth that the sun revolves around the earth, we today we know better. Mm -hmm. And science isn't just about the stars; it's about no. biology and psychology and and the well, human. And this is level. and this is where um, how do you interpret scripture? Well, you interpret scripture with other scriptures. Um, the passage I really like uh, for this is Matthew 13, where it's the parable of the weeds and the wheat, where, um, you know, the uh, the farmer and his his employees, his employees, employees, his servants say, look, there are weeds growing up with the wheat. You want us to go out and pull them? And, and the farmer says, no, I don't think so, because you're not going to be able to tell which is which and uh, you're going to pull up some wheat. And so my argument is, look, presume wheat, not weeds, and, you know, things will get sorted out. Um, so don't presume that you have the ability to say, oh, yes, this sinner here is going straight to hell. Um, I remember I had a debate once with Marty Swords. You know, Marty. I do. Uh, a professor at Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. And we were having this debate and we did the, this kind of dog and pony show. And um, he concluded by saying at present, he didn't see any evidence that would mandate the church to change its historic position on not ordaining uh, gay and lesbian people. Mm. And I said, well, Marty, what would count as evidence? And how would you recognize it if you saw it? And Marty paused and he said, I'm not sure what would count as evidence, but I know I would recognize it if I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, Marty, you know, there are all kinds of gay and lesbian Christians who are the evidence and they're asking for you to recognize them. And, you know, that was the end of the conversation. Uh, and well, so, of course, since then, you know, the churches have split over yes. this. Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, it's yeah. on we go. On we go. And, you know, the thing is, it's just for me, um, you know, you pick this thing that somebody has an alternative lifestyle that you don't approve of, but you don't, you know, if you don't pick other things, no. you, know, you don't pick somebody who's a glutton, you know, or somebody who is an adulterer or you, you don't, you know, you say, well, OK, you know, I mean, there, there are things that don't apply. I mean, to, and so, OK, so um, I mean, it sounds to me like. You know, it sounds like you and I agree that Paul and Jesus, they probably didn't like the idea of men sleeping with men, but their 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 concept of what that was all about. They didn't have our institution. They didn't have institutions of marriage. I mean, you know, that you like you fall in love, you date somebody and you go, you know, you fall in love and you get married. They didn't have anything like that. And with no. you know, the idea of two adults having a relationship where they decide they want to to have intimacy together. It was like, there was nothing like that in the ancient no. So it's kind of hard to condemn something you've never heard of. So, uh, okay, Jeff, could you- uh, where, Unless where, you're doing it, unless you're anachronistic. Unless you're anachronistic. You know, you're, you're kind of, you're pretending that you're living in the same time period as someone else when you're not. And so, yeah. okay, so Jeff, we need to end now. Can you just kind of summarize your views? What, I mean, about the Bible condemning homosexuality? All right. Um, well, to summarize, um, there are six passages in the Bible that uh, deal in some way, shape, or form with same-sex relations. Uh, three in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. Uh, three in the New Testament. Um, the Genesis 19, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 1. Um, the Genesis 19 passage is talking about sexual violence and rape. The Levitical passages are quite explicit in condemning same-sex uh, sex between men, but uh, the larger context of the Holiness Code makes it, it difficult to 
um, say, yes, these should be interpreted literally because of all the other things that are condemned that we have no problem with. Um, and then in the New Testament, the um, 1 Corinthians 6 passage has to do with um, uh, probably male prostitution um, and the same in 1 Timothy. And the Romans 1 passage uh, has to do with idolatry and uh, people who, the pagans who are guilty of idolatry, um, they tend towards things that Paul considers unnatural. Um, the problem is that Paul's understanding uh, of nature uh, as unchanging um, and our understanding of nature as unchanging is, is difficult. And um, the understanding of sexual orientation is not one that the ancients had. Um, that we do. And even in our own time, just in the last century, um, as everybody knows, we've seen some rather uh, sweeping change in societal attitudes towards uh, people who self-identify as gay, lesbian, or transgender. Um, the fight still goes on, but um, here we are. Okay. So um, I um, I think I might uh, point out just to uh... Uh, put you in the public public view here that uh, that Jeff, you um, unlike me, you are a uh, you're a Christian. <laughs> I, I am. Yeah. And and you you're actually an ordained minister. And yeah. uh, so this is not like a crazy uh, atheist teaching at Chapel Hill talking. <laughs> you you really don't think that this is these, you know, and and yeah, that the Bible's condemning what we think of as homosexual or that it's applicable. And, to I, our, and I would also to our situation. I would also point out, I mean, I I um, <laughs> I got into this whole discussion uh, really quite by accident um, because I was on a committee uh, in L.A. for the Presbyterian Church that oversaw the ordination process. And since Presbyterians have to learn Hebrew and Greek, I was the, the language geek on the committee, um, you know, examining people. And there was a gay man, who, uh, Chris Glasser. Um, uh, he wrote a book called Uncommon Calling, A Gay Man's Struggle to Serve the Church. Mm. And um, he came up uh, for whether we would approve him to be ordained. And I didn't know what to, to do. And I abstained from the vote. He was he was not passed. Um, and I decided I, I better find out um, what I think and why. Um, and so that's what led to the first thing I published which was way back in, gosh, 87, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the book. So um, change change comes slowly. It's hard for people. It's hard for people to kind of um, think differently from how they've been raised. And but it it is thankfully a really it's a it's a very serious movement within within Christianity now yes. to take seriously the fact that we're living in a different age. Yes. And that you uh, and um, it is happening, but there's a lot of resistance as well, as, as you've said. So, well, okay. one other we, thing, yeah, one other yeah. thing. Um, I've often said that uh, I have one foot in the church, one foot in the academy, and then each helps to keep the other honest. Hmm. And it's my foot in the academy that helps me to engage in critical reading of of the biblical texts that can then be of service to the church. And I think the service is providing contextual understandings of these things, which is, I know what you're all about as well. Yeah. I usually, I, I, I've got an analogous thing. I've got one church in the, one, one, one foot in the academy and one foot in my mouth. Most of the time. <laughs> How's that working out for you? Yeah. Well. Not too well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look, Jeff, it's been great. Uh, having yes. you on and I really appreciate it. And um, so uh, well, hopefully we can, you know, next, next time we'll talk about the Syriac New Testament. <laughs> oh, and by the way, this, this is Judy who Bart introduced me to ah, um, yeah. right there. There she is in, 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 in all of her, her one of her fine moments of glory. <laughs> <There's been many. laughs> all right. Good. Well, all thank right. you all. Thank you all for tuning into the podcast and we will have another really interesting one next week. <laughs> Thanks right. so much. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. 
We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.